Our topic is the mind-body connection. Your health is 90% mental. The connection between mind and body represents one of the remaining vast frontiers of modern medicine. Improving our connection between mind and body may greatly increase our quality of life and longevity while reducing the occurrence and burden of chronic diseases and disability later in life. A few of my industry disclosures. As a disclaimer, this presentation is intended to give general information and does not provide specific medical device. This presentation and the heartdrjim.com website do not create a doctor-patient relationship between you and myself, Dr. James Canneller. Information in this presentation is not intended to diagnose or treat any condition. Therefore, Dr. James Canneller, myself, and Heart Dr. Jim are not responsible for any losses, damages, or claims that may result from your medical decisions. Let's start with beauty of form and function, perfection versus reality. When we discuss health and medicine, we are joining one of the most ancient and lofty of human activities. We've been inspired by the form, intricacy, complexity, in, and beauty of the human body for centuries. The ancients mastered anatomy and gave many important contributions to anatomy which have lasted and endured to this day. We received a vision of physical perfection, strong, lean, tall, purposeful, a model and inspiration for what the human body may achieve. And here we see the sculpture David by Michelangelo created between 1501 and 04 with all of these highly desirable features consistent with a perfected human physique. And then there's reality. Most people do not exemplify physical perfection. Most do not have perfect genetics and are shaped by less than perfect health habits and also by diseases. The physician sees the possibility for for perfection in each person and attempts to move each person, the patient, towards optimal health one step at a time, willing to take that individual as close to optimal health as is possible. We are a composite of overlapping anatomic structures. We contain nervous, cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal, pulmonary skin systems which overlap our superimposed integrated to form a highly functioning and very sophisticated individual. And there are interrela interrelated dynamic systems. The human body is not static. Among these structures are multiple interrelated dynamic systems. We have endocrine, reproductive, immunity, urinary, integumentary, nervous, muscul musculoskeletal, circulatory, respiratory, gastrointestinal, there is coordination and communication between these dynamic systems and industrious metabolic processes occurring within each of these and between these to support the function of the whole person. Bioelectricity. In addition, we are highly electrical beings. There are three major electrophysiologic centers, centers of electrical activity in the human body. In order of strength, these are number one, the heart number two, the brain, and finally, number three, the gut or the enteric nervous system. And we'll discuss each of these in a little bit more detail. Heart and brain energy. The heart and brain are electrical organs, and as such, they generate a 360-degree electroanatomic field, which is surrounding each person and can be measured up to 10 feet away from a particular individual. The brain. The brain is an electrical organ. This can be recorded using an electroencephalogram, which we see here. Here we have this individual being attached with electrodes across his scalp. Each of those, as we see in these tracings, record the electrical activity of the underlying brain tissue. And neurologists can use this information, hopefully, to make useful diagnoses to help patients who are having certain neurological conditions. Today, we appreciate that the brain is very electrical and that the electrical activity of that very complex organ can be measured externally and extends around a certain radius uh, surrounding any particular individual. The heart similarly has electrical activity and that can be recorded with an electrocardiogram or ECG. And here we see an individual with electrodes attached to his arm and to his legs and across his chest which record the electrical activity of the heart. Here we see the recording of a person who's in a very normal, smooth, and 
rhythmic electrical heart pattern. So your heart is in fact stronger than your brain electrically. Compared to the electro electromagnetic field produced by the brain, the electrical component of the heart's field is about 60 times greater in amplitude. The heart's field permeates every cell in the body and is felt within a certain radius surrounding each person. The heart is 5,000 fold stronger magnetically than the brain and the majority of the electromagnetic field surrounding us in fact rises from our heart as opposed to rising from our brains. Changes in the electromagnetic sound pressure, blood pressure waves produced by cardiac rhythmic activity are felt by every cell of the body as a global internal synchronizing signal. We talk about psychophysiological coherence of heart rhythms. Rhythmic beating patterns change as our emotions shift. For example, negativity, which is anger or frustration, can pr produce an erratic, incoherent pattern of heart activity, while positivity, such as love and appreciation, can give a smooth and orderly pattern to our heart rhythms. Positive emotions produce psychophysiological coherence in this regard, that is smooth, undulating, wave-like patterns in the heart's electrical activity. The electromagnetic field correspondingly becomes more organized from the heart. This field is felt throughout the body. It's felt in a radius surrounding each individual up to 45 feet away from the person's core. We know that your heart in many ways controls your brain, contrary to what is often thought. Positive emotions give rise to coherent heart rhythms, which improve the heart's electromagnetic field. And then the heart's improved field influences the brain, facilitating further positive emotions. There's a system of heart neurons with have, which have both long and short-term memory. The heart produces hormones, which also influence the brain. There is biomechanical information via blood pressure waves. And finally, energetic information from the heart. Strong electrical and electromagnetic fields are influencing the brain and other organ systems continually. Your heart influences those around you. The electromagnetic energy radiating from your heart modulates the physiology and emotional experience, that is the moods, attitudes, and feelings of the people who are immediately around you. And this is unescapable. Your brain also modulates your heart. Different emotions cause clear rhythmic patterns and beat to beat heart rate variability. So for example, in this graph, we have a range of heart rates here varying between 60 and about 90 beats per minute. And we see that when the individual is in a state of frustration, those heart rates do oscillate between 60 and 90 beats per minute approximately, but in this fragmented and rough erratic pattern corresponding to that negative emotional state. In that same individual, under conditions of feeling genuine appreciation, we see that the heart rate continues to oscillate between rates of 60 and 80 to 90 beats a minute, but we're now doing it in a very smooth, fluid, sinusoidal pattern, a coherent pattern corresponding to that very positive emotion of appreciation. We know that emotions are reflected in heart rhythm patterns, just as we've seen here again between 60 and 90 beats a minute in an individual who is experiencing frustration the same heart rate variability, but in this erratic and fragmented fashion. When that individual then shifts to a feeling of appreciation, we have again a very smooth undulating pattern of heart rhythms, which is a harmonious and coherent pattern corresponding to that very positive emotional state. So we see clearly how the brain is modulating the effects of the heart, the range of heart rates that the heart is experiencing, the pattern of the heart rate variability, altering the heart's magnetic field by so doing in a way that can positively or negatively impact the well-being of the person. And to a certain degree, those people surrounding that individual, as we will see that person's heart signal does show up and influence the brains and the heart of people who are close to the individual. So here we see your heart changes your neighbor's brain. We have subject A and subject B 
for subject A, we are showing the heart, the brainwave pattern. For subject B, we are showing the heartbeat. These individuals right now are seated four feet apart over a period of about 10 minutes. And then these, picture, these individuals reach across that distance and begin holding hands, and that's continued for five minutes. And here for subject A, the brainwave activity now shows the strong signal from subject B's heart rhythm, while the heart rhythm of subject B appears unchanged as the brain is having a much smaller effect on subject B's heart activity. So a strong signal of one individual's heart in the brain patterns of another, another person's heart, that facilitated by both their close proximity and the fact that they are in physical contact. So strong influences from the people who surround us and from the people who touch us on a daily basis. Your heart changes your neighbor's heart. Heart rhythm entrainment between two people. And here are two female subjects who are consciously feeling appreciation towards each other. And we can see how the heart rate pattern variability occurs very similarly and in the same direction at the same time as that person who they are feeling that strong emotional connection to at that time. Here we have a married couple during sleep. Two individuals in close contact, similar heart rate variability, patterns changing in a coherent fashion where these two have synchronized to a certain extent their heart rate variability due to the contact and connection they feel um, during sleep. Very interesting. This can also happen between animals and their pets. Here we have a boy influencing his dog. The dog is Mabel and the boy is Josh. Initially, Josh and Mabel are in separate rooms, and we see that both have an elevated heart rate, which does appear to be somewhat erratic. Josh then enters the room and feels love for his dog, Mabel, and we see that both have a decrease in their overall heart rates with coherence in the range of heart rate variability that they are experiencing while they're together. So they've def the presence and the emotional experience of each other has influenced the heart rate in a very important way where when Josh then leaves the room and Mabel wants him to stay, the heart rates of both increase and become erratic as they had prior to him entering the room in the first place. So again, the emotional state, the appreciation of both the presence of both strongly influencing the heart rate patterns of the other in a way which could be interpreted as helpful when they are together and probably less helpful when they are separated. And this is something we can practice, developing electrophysiologic coherence. There is a certain technology, simple stuff that we can attach to and practice modulating our own hearts um, as we experience different emotional states. And this is a technology that's available. It's not one that I've used personally, but it is something that intrigues me and I would strongly consider um, experimenting with in the future. So I make it available to you in the case you, and in the event that you'd like to get started before me. And finally, we'll talk about the gut or the enteric nervous system. This is sometimes called the second brain, underappreciated. There are 400 to 600 million neurons within your gut, your gastrointestinal tract. That's three to four times more than are in a rat brain. And we know that a rat is a very intelligent creature. This nervous system produces 95% of the body's serotonin, which is a mood regulation pain perception neurotransmitter. We know that depletion of serotonin can disinhibit centers of anger and aggression, truly change your emotional experience, the way you're feeling, which will then of course impact on your heart, on the people around you. Very important that the neurotransmitter regulating these processes is in fact coming from your gut. In addition, the gut produces about 50% of dopamine, a major neurotransmitter for reward and for pleasure. The gut nervous system acts independently. It talks to the brain, not just receives information from your brain, and it influences your behavior. Gives truth to the expression, what we feed our stomach feeds our minds. So we need to be aware of all three major electrical physiologic centers controlling our physiology, the quality of our lives in very unique, independent, and, and powerful ways. So we have the bi-directional 
um, gut-brain axis. From brain to gut, we have signals for motility, permeability, immune function, and from the gut to the brain, important neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine, and ghrelin. There's bacterial metabolites from the bacteria in the gut, which are independently sending signals to the brain, influencing neurologic function. And we have modulation of the gut sensory afferents. That means the brain signals coming from the brain to the gut, the gut has opportunity to revise those signals and adjust the message that it's receiving from the brain based on its own independent preferences. The enteric nervous system and the gut bacterial flora. Let's recognize in our gut that 90% of our body cells are in fact bacteria. There are three pounds of microbes living in the average human gut, and these bacteria contain 100 times more genetic information and therefore plasticity than the human genome. So we have this complex bacterial community. The bacteria harvest energy from the diet. They provide nutrition to gut cells. They protect against infection, influence mood and behavior, and produce their own versions of neurotransmitters which do influence us. Antibiotics, for example, can alter gut flora and impact behavior. And sometimes we'll hear our patients or our families say, he or she was never the same after the illness. And we wonder if that was due to alterations in gut bacterial flora due to some of our treatments, such as with antibiotics. And we'll speak much more about maintaining the health and integrity of our gut bacterial flora and the importance that that can mean for our overall health and well-being. We have a discussion of irritable bowel syndrome by Johns Hopkins physician and neurogastroenterologist. Data shows that 30 to 40 percent of individuals will experience some functional bowel problems, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, pain at some point. A higher than normal percent of people with functional bowel problems and irritable, irritable bowel syndrome will go on to develop depression and anxiety such that gastroenterologists become like counselors, looking to soothe the second brain, as it were, as they attempt to assist their patients. So here we are, complex anatomy, complex physiology, three independent electrophysiologic centers influencing every fiber of our being while we influence and are influenced by those individuals who are surrounding us with this complex system we would like to optimize our own potential, find strategies to optimize the health and well-being of this very complex and dynamic system in a way which favors its utility, productivity, longevity, and quality for as many years as are at all possible. So mind-body connection, again, the subject of our talk, let's consider in addition um, the evidence for a mind-body connection. We start with the broken heart syndrome. What is the broken heart syndrome? Other names for this condition include a stress-induced cardiomyopathy, an apical ballooning syndrome, or Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. So what exactly do these mean? Here we see a uh, a schematic of a normal heart and the chamber shown in red is the left ventricle or the main pumping chamber of that heart. In the setting of the broken heart syndrome or a Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, we see that that pumping chamber is markedly dilated with thinning of the pumping chamber's wall. So this is the cardiomyopathy. Why is it called a Takotsubo? Because it was discovered in Japan and in fact the heart's chamber does take on the shape of a Takotsubo which is a traditional octopus trap um, that's been used um, for many years in that country. So here we have that ballooning of the main pumping chamber of the heart in response to intense emotional stress, which constitutes the broken heart syndrome. So we know the broken heart syndrome is the result of sudden emotional or physical stress. It's due to excessive stress and adrenaline release. It prevent, presents very much like an acute coronary syndrome, also known as a heart attack. So 2% of all patients who have a presumed heart attack due to their presentation with chest pain, shortness of breath, unexplained fatigue, nausea, things of this nature are found to have the broken heart syndrome. 
It's a diagnosis in patients who develop ballooning of the left ventricle in the absence of, of obstructive coronary disease. So someone seems that they're having a heart attack, they have a cardiomyopathy, we image the arteries to the heart, we're found to have no atherosclerotic coronary disease or no significant obstructive atherosclerotic coronary disease. Nevertheless, there is apical or midventricular failure of that main pumping chamber, and we make the diagnosis of broken heart syndrome or Takotsubo uh, cardiomyopathy. So just to show you that a little bit more, here we see an angiogram of, a, of that heart chamber. We put a catheter into the heart and injected it with dye to image. I'll trace here, this is the main pumping chamber of the heart at the time when the heart is relaxing. And then when that heart contracts, we see how that chamber becomes much smaller, almost sliver-like, as, as it has injected that volume of blood um, into the central circulation. In the presence of a patient with broken heart syndrome or apical ballooning, we see a very similar pattern during relaxation. Then at the time of contraction, the neck has indeed contracted very nicely, but the apice of that chamber or the tip continues to have that ballooning pattern as its contractility has in fact failed. So this is the broken heart syndrome. And again, we understand that the heart is heavily, heavily innervated from the brain and from the autonomic nervous system, such that if there is a very strong discharge from the brain, from the nervous system, it can dramatically impact the heart in such a way that an individual may develop this Takotsubo uh, cardiomyopathy. So here to see one more time, we have an 86-year-old woman who accompanied her husband to the emergency department. Half an hour into his evaluation, she reported chest pain, substernal with pressure-like quality, two of 10 in severity, with slight radiation into the left chest. It sounds like she is also having a heart attack. She's taken to the cardiac catheterization lab where that pumping chamber is imaged. We see that during relaxation, her heart has a completely normal strape shape, but during contraction, there is ballooning of a major portion of that heart chamber consistent with the broken heart syndrome. She's not having a heart attack. She doesn't have coronary artery disease. In response to her husband's illness, she is experiencing intense emotional upset sufficient to cause the broken heart syndrome in her. So today we experience, we, we appreciate just how strong the nervous interaction between the brain and the heart can be. Moving on, we'll discuss psychological conditioning as another source of evidence of the mind-body connection. I think everybody's heard of Pavlov's dogs. This is a classical conditioning experiment. As you recall, Ivan Pavlov lived in Russia in the, early 18, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and he received his Nobel Prize in Physiology in 1904 for a very curious experiment with, um, that he performed with, with dogs. What um, Dr. Pavlov would do is he would observe that when he fed his dogs with their usual dog chow, the dogs would drool. He then rang a bell measured the stool in his dogs and there was nothing. He then paired these, the, the stimuli of the bell with the eating of food. So he would present the food, the dog would drool, and at the same time he would ring the bell. The result of his classic experiment is that after continuing the food bell association for a period of time, simply ringing the bell was enough to get his dogs to drool. And that may seem like a very innocent result, a very simple result. It's sort of comical, and I think we joke about it a lot. But what is the significance of it? There is tremendous significance to this, as is the case with most Nobel Prize winning research. For example, we all know Einstein's equation is E equals MC squared. I don't think many of us quite know what that means, but we're certainly familiar with the equation. We know somehow this is what's governing our universe. It's something that has high impact for physics. Similarly, um, Pavlov's dog experiment has very high impact for behavioral psychology. So classical conditioning is pairing an unconditioned stimulus with a conditioned stimulus. So the conditioned stimulus, for example, is neutral. It's the sound of a bell. The unconditioned stimulus is very potent, for example, salivation. Again, this is a high impact research result because it suggests the possibility for us to condition our own physiology in very deliberate ways. We can develop 
conditioned stimuli, very neutral, benign things, which can in our own bodies generate very powerful and real physiologic effects. And honestly, the possibilities are endless, and hence this is Nobel Prize winning research. Curiously, perhaps those who are most taking advantage of Pavlov's experiments are those leading the personal development industry. For example, here's Anthony Robbins, Unleash the Power Within, full of psychological tips and tricks to get the most out of your performance. You, he'll teach you how to place yourself in a certain state when needed. For example, if we need to feel very excited on command, we can generate feelings of intense excitement in our bodies. And when we do, we could, for example, clap our hands, generate intense feelings of excitement and clap our hands, generate intense feelings of excitement, clap our hands. Then, when we need to feel intense feelings of excitement, we simply clap our hands and feel a rush of those positive emotions which we've conditioned our minds to generate with that very simple stimulus. And it is exceedingly powerful. Here's even a more convincing experiment where this dog is ejected with adrenaline. And as you would expect, in response to the adrenaline, the blood pressure rises. Now, the dog is injected with a hormone or neurotransmitter rather, that induces a state of relaxation. And we see in response to that, the blood pressure correspondingly decreases. But now we're pairing that neurotransmitter with a sound stimulus, a siren, such that later with adequate pairing, in the presence of that sound stimulus, even when the adrenaline is re-injected, back into that dog's physiology, we see the same blood pressure decline that we saw with the relaxing neurotransmitter. So the conditioned response, the response from the brain, exceedingly strong, able to overcome and completely reverse even the effects of the injection of adrenaline. Again, we appreciate the strength of the mind-body connection and are left to puzzle at what may be possible if we could only harness this power to our own benefit. Another example, mind-body connection from the placebo effect. What is a placebo? A placebo effect is a remarkable phenomenon in which a placebo, which is a fake treatment, an inactive substance like sugar, distilled water, or a saline solution, can sometimes improve a patient's condition simply because the person has the expectation that it will be helpful. That expectation is strong enough to obtain the positive health benefit which the treatment promises to make, except that it is a false treatment. A very famous example of that comes from UCLA. Here's a story of a Mr. Wright who was in fact dying um, from cancer of the lymph nodes. He had orange ball sized tumors invading his neck, groin, chest, and abdomen. Doctors had exhausted all available treatment options. Nevertheless, Mr. Wright was confident that a new anti-cancer drug called Crebazin would cure him. Mr. Wright was bedridden and fighting for each breath when he received his first injection. Three days later, he was cheerfully walking around the unit and joking with the nurses. Mr. Wright's tumors had shrunken by half, and after 10 days more of his treatment, he was discharged from hospital. Other patients in the hospital who received Crebazin showed no improvement, and that's because the medication doesn't work. It's no longer relevant and not at all part of our clinical armamentarium. But here, a very powerful example of placebo effect where this patient's consuming belief in the treatment, although a false treatment, is sufficient for him to receive the healing benefit of that treatment. Another example, here from the journal Neurology in 2015, expensive drugs work better. Here we have 12 patients with Parkinson's disease who were told that two drugs for Parkinson's were to be tested. One drug cost $100, while the other drug cost $1,500 per dose. The patients were told that these drugs contain the same dose of the same medicine. However, the manufacturing processes were different. There was then the experiment was, or the researchers were testing to see if these two preparations of the same drug worked equally well. What the subjects did not know is that they all received a identical injection of a plain saline solution. They weren't even receiving medication. 
It was found that the expensive placebo worked significantly better, producing a two-fold improvement compared with the cheap one. Those patients who understood and truly believed that they were receiving a far more expensive version of exactly the same drug at exactly the same dose had a two-fold greater response to the false treatment than those who believed they were receiving the less expensive preparation. A uh, very compelling example of the strength of the placebo effect being a cure from the mind. The placebo effect is strong scientific evidence that we have the ability to heal ourselves. Our thoughts are powerful enough to transform our bodies if they could only be harnessed appropriately. And the placebo effect is no mystery. Mechanisms, very mundane, usual mechanisms have been proposed to explain the placebo effect, which really does rely on psychosocial context. We have the patient's cognitions, which is their expectations, their belief, their trust, their hope. We have this paired with a condition stimulus, which is the act of taking a pill. And that has been paired with an unconditioned stimulus, which is the active ingredient. Of course, in the case of the placebo, the active ingredient is in fact missing. But when that is paired with the form of a pill, that's sufficient to trick the patient's mind in a way that interacts with their cognition such that the healing effect is generated and does in fact occur. So again, the placebo effect being very strong evidence for a robust mind-body connection and for what the mind-body connection has the potential to achieve in any one individual if we can simply harness it at the appropriate time. Another example of mind-body connection can be obtained from the field of heart transplantation. And this is something that's very close to cardiologists like myself and a significant part of our practice. Here we have heart transplantation, a major operation where a patient's heart can be removed from their bodies and during which a donor's heart can be substituted for that heart by attaching it to the major structures from which the original heart was removed. So here we see operations involving a heart transplant and here we see a heart transplant patient who has survived his heart transplant doing very well and is in fact holding in his hand his old original heart um, which was removed as a life-saving measure. So a very interesting world transforming the lives of individuals who can receive heart transplants represents a last treatment option for those with desperate cardiomyopathies who need life-saving therapies and whose organs themselves um, cannot be fixed sufficiently to allow that person to do well. Here is a very curious result from the, in the context of heart transplant, more than a new heart. This is the story of a 47-year-old woman, Claire Sylvia, who received a heart and lung transplant from an 18-year-old boy who was killed in a motorcycle. Interestingly, she awoke from her transplant operation craving beer and with a taste for new food, snicker bars, green peppers, Kentucky Fried Chicken takeaway. She had never wanted beer previously, had never been interested in Kentucky Fried Chicken, awoke from her transplant operation, in fact, having developed a new taste for these things. She says in her book on this experience, I was more aggressive and assertive than I used to be, even more confident as well. I felt tougher, fitter, and I stopped getting colds. Even my walk became sort of more manly. I felt a new power that I associated with strength and vibrancy. My feminine tentativeness had fallen away. I didn't feel the same need to have a boyfriend as I had felt um, before my operation. She goes on to say that she dreamed about her donor. He gave her his name in the dream. They planned never to be separated in that dream. With the name he had given her, Sylvia was able to look up his family, meet the family, and learn that her donor did in fact have a strong taste for beer, peppers, snicker bars, KFC, was a very confident individual, and always in excellent health. So we hear a very convincing story of a woman who has received someone's heart and as a result of receiving that person's heart also obtained many of the personality traits and preferences of that individual. 
In another example, Kevin Mashford received the donor heart of a man who died in a cycling accident. He since went on to develop a passion for cycling. Another compelling story, Bill Wall, a hard-hitting top executive with a tight hold on his emotions. In the year 2000, he received a heart transplant at the University of Arizona. A few weeks after the oper operation, Wool heard a song by a star vocalist, Sade, an artist who he had never heard before. He says, I just started crying and rocking in response to hearing that song. He later contacted his donor's family and learned that his donor, Brady Michaels, had been a huge fan of the singer Sade. Michaels was a Hollywood stuntman who died in a freak accident. Wool became a competitive athlete, winning numerous medals among the transplant trials. More than a new heart, an eight-year-old girl, eight girl received a heart from a 10-year-old female murder victim. The recipient child suffered dramatic post-operative nightmares about the murder of a young girl. The dreams recurred and were taken seriously by her psychiatrist, who perceived them to be genuine memories from the donor. The details in the dream proved to be so accurate that the information resulted in the arrest of the murderer. All these very compelling stories about what may be contained in someone's heart and what someone's heart may in fact contribute to their overall well-being and their emotional experience and almost to the activities of their brains does present us with a very curious question. What if someone were to receive your heart? And the question for us to consider is, is your heart wired with positivity and strength and vitality? Is your heart coaxing the most life and performance from every cell of your body? And how can we program and fortify our hearts for optimal quality of life, performance, and longevity? This is harnessing the mind-body connection, integrating it deeply into every structure and cell in our body to give us the highest quality of life, best performance, and optimal um, longevity that is possible. If only we had a systematic way to do this. And we'll, we'll talk about what might be possible. So receiving personality and identity from organ donors, there's a potential scientific basis. Um, researchers in this area have offered explanations that are very plausible. All systems in the body, including the brain and heart, have feedback loops, which process and transfer information back and forth. Because of the feedback loops, the heart is able to store energy and information for the same reason the brain does. The prediction is that memory exists in every heart. The question is what percentage of people who receive a heart become aware of that information or are significantly influenced by it compared to the power of their own memory. So a very physiologic basis for what otherwise has somewhat of a creepy flavor and um, we see that we don't need voodoo or something else strange to explain this. In fact, those organs do contain that neurologic information which can be transferred to an individual by very physiologic means in the setting of, say, a heart transplant. So we look for other health benefits then of the mind-body connection, and this has been studied in great detail. We have learned that optimistic people have healthier hearts. And here's an article from 2015, a study of 5,000 adults aged 45 to 84 found that the most optimistic people had twice the odds of being in ideal cardiovascular health compared to their pessimistic um, counterparts. So in this study, cardiovascular health was assessed using seven metrics. There was blood pressure, body mass index, dietary intake, physical activity, fasting, plasma glucose or sugar levels, serum cholesterol, and tobacco use. So these seven metrics, scores of zero, one, or two points given for poor, intermediate, or ideal to each of these seven health metrics for a max score of 14. Participants completed surveys to assess mental health and um, levels of optimism that then would correspond to their score on these seven health on these seven health metrics. Total health scores increased in tandem with levels of optimism. People the most optimistic were twice as likely to have ideal cardiovascular health. The association was even stronger when age, race, ethnicity, income, and educational status were factored in or accounted for. Optimists had significantly better blood sugar and total cholesterol, were more physically active, and had healthier body mass indices 
and were less likely to smoke compared to their less positive counterparts. There was a significant reduction in death rates at a population um, level for those optimists, and the study suggested that there was a biobehavioral mechanism involved here where it was, in fact, that positive emotional state that was predisposing to the higher health indices and significantly reduced death rates of those involved. So an upbeat emotion that's surprisingly good for you. We know that unpleasant emotions for years, such as shame, depression, and anxiety are linked to poor health. We just learned that positive emotions, optimism, predisposed to good health. So then we might ask the question, which positive emotion is in fact best for you? Would that be amusement? Would that be compassion, contentment, joy, love, pride, awe? Which of these might be best for you? A surprising result from a study also published in 2015 showed that the emotion of awe is particularly health generating and happily awe is easy even for busy people and stressed out people uh, to experience. So this experiment involved 119 students at the University of California, Berkeley, who were assessed for their emotional experiences um, of seven emotions, awe, amusement, compassion, contentment, joy, love, pride. Saliva from those students was then analyzed for interleukin-6, a molecule that strongly associates with systemic inflammation, which is against our health. Happy moods were associated with the lowest, with low interleukin-6 levels, with the strongest of these happy moods being for awe. The more awestruck individuals reported being, the lower their interleukin-6. On average, students at Berkeley were experiencing awe at least three times per week. What is an awe-inspiring moment? This is one that passes the goosebump test. It can be listening to music, watching a, sub, a sunset, attending a political rally for those who are so inclined, watching children play. It's different for everyone, but whatever generates that feeling of awe in you is something which is going to maximally promote your health and wellness from a positive mental standpoint. So awe has a pronounced impact on inflammation, and the study advises all of us to, sink, to seek awe as often as possible. Someone has studied, does charitable giving lift, lead to better health? Is it really better to give than to receive? A growing body of research suggests charitable giving is good for your health. Giving to others reduces stress, stress and strengthens your immune system, which results in better health and longer life expectancy. So charitable, such as tax subsidies, have been shown to have a positive spill over onto health. And this is why research of this nature would show up in the Wall Street Journal, where the study um, did demonstrate that those larger tax subsidies in response to charitable donations did have a positive impact on health. The study concluded that a 1% increase in tax rate subsidy for charitable giving could produce a 0.1% increase in health index. So the positive relationship between charitable giving and self-reported health status as the donation amount increases, health status, in fact, improves. And this may be another public health measure our government could consider um, to make us more healthy by giving us incentive to participate in charitable giving. Another body of evidence for the positive Five reasons why it's critical to follow your heart. And this can strike us in very uncomfortable ways because we have examples, I think all of us, in our lives where we chose not to follow our hearts and probably for reasons of practicality or perhaps fear. So intuition and practicing the nudge imperative. We know intuition gets sharper with more use. Humans are a radar. They get sharper with use. Um... Intuition gives brilliance sometimes when logic and rational thought fails. We all know that regret is bad. Um, the path you envision is in fact the happiest one. By following intuition, we avoid the what ifs later in life. Regret is one of the worst emotions we can experience. By following um, the nudge imperative, by following our intuition, we can gain unexpected respect and admiration from those around us. Um, this is the practice of honoring who you are the courage to swim upstream, 
And failing to follow the nudge imperative or to follow intuition can in fact catch up with us. The path of least resistance does not necessarily get easier. We can avoid numbness and complacency if we follow our own strongest tendencies in the first place, avoid the nagging feeling that something is amiss. It's not too late to stop, be still, take stock, listen to the inner voice, and adjust our trajectories. There's acute clarity about both who you are and where you are when we follow the nudge imperative. We can be clear and unapologetic in our sense of purpose, be open and expectant with ordinary encounters. Very ordinary things can become deeply meaningful when we are coming from a place of our deepest intuition. And that clarity and focus can improve the happiness and animate those around us. This is a very interesting article um, published by Natalie Dixon, who presently is the director of the Strategic Design MBA at Philadelphia University. She discusses for us three types of intuition. There is ordinary intuition, which is very instinctual, expert intuition, which is a trained response, and then strategic intuition, which can be defined as a flash of insight. So Natalie Dixon says, I am so happy that I decided to study anthropology and Africana studies those years ago. No one ever had to tell me to work harder, get up earlier, or stay later. And that lens continues to serve me well in my work today. When you follow the internal nudge, you develop a magnetic energy and opportunities really do come to you. You might say it's a practice that could save your life. So most Advisors may say studying anthropology and Africana studies aren't exactly a practical choice. Maybe you should do something else that is more practical, gives you a better chance of getting a job. Here's an individual who says, by following my strong intuition that this was, in fact, the best path for me, I arrived at a career position in which I am maximally satisfied and feel like my own horizons are um, the greatest and most appealing. And finally, the mind-body connection has been studied in the context of increased longevity. It's okay to be old if you feel good. Older people who feel young are less likely to die. So here's data from the English Longitudinal Study on Aging. Over 6,000 elderly people, or those age above 52, enrolled in 2004 to 2009, followed, followed for 99 months, and those subjects were asked the question, how old do you feel you are? The actual age of the participants was 65.8 years. The average self-perceived age was 56.8 years. So 70% felt that they were at least three years younger. 26% felt that they were about their actual age. And only 5% felt that they were one year older than they actually were. 12,066 of the volunteers died during the course of the study but deaths were not evenly distributed. Mortality rates showed that 24.6 of those who felt older had passed compared to 18.5% who felt their actual age compared to only 14.3% of those who felt much younger than their actual age. And this study was controlled for health problems such as heart disease, diabetes, cancer, arthritis, depression, for behavioral factors, including smoking, drinking, spending time engaged in social activities. It controlled for gender, ethnicity, education, and wealth. The risk of death during the study was 41% higher for those who felt older versus those who felt younger, teaching us that if we genuinely feel younger than we are, this positive feeling is in fact associated with our improved um, longevity. A younger self-image may help memory as we age. Those who felt older scored 25% lower on memory and cognitive tests compared to those who felt younger. The association between younger subjective age Better memory, executive functioning was independent, again, of gender, education, achievement, mental, static, mental status, and chronic diseases. So again, those who felt older, scoring worse on memory. Those who feel younger, scoring better on memory, better on cognitive tests, meaning that self-perception of being youthful is protective and improving 
the performance of individuals through a strong mind-body connection. And in fact, personality traits, uh, traits of, of the centenarians have been studied. There are four large centenarian studies that have been conducted so far. Georgia, Judish, Tokyo, Swedish. Four personality traits from those studies have been identified in those who are thriving, living well, um, between 100 years of age. So what are the four personality secrets of centenarians? And then you can ask yourself, do you have the right personality to live to be 100? And those four traits were found to be number one, easygoing, number two, optimistic, number three, love to laugh, and number four, outgoing. Now these traits might be partially due to genes, but they're also highly influenced by everyday actions and choices in life that can positively shape your personality. So you can choose your personality traits and those personality traits can then go on to impact your longevity and the quality of life that you experience during your increased longevity. So do you have the right personality to live to be 100? We know that one in every 4,400 persons in the United States lives to be 100. And living to 100 is not determined by lucky genes. Only 25% of longevity is in fact genetic. And we learned this from the Danish twin study. Most or 75% of longevity is in fact due to lifestyle choices. Lifestyle is affected by the personality we choose to put forward each day, Personality establishes our priorities, our stress level, our mindset, our relationships, and much more. We can adopt the right personality traits for the greatest longevity, improve our chances of living well to age 100 and beyond. So the four personality secrets of centenarians, what is it about these traits for those who are easygoing? We know that stress and anxiety really do age us. High stress shortens telomeres. It's degrading the quality of our DNA, of our genetic information by as much as 10 years of life. That is high stress. So by being easygoing, we avoid these high stress situations. Being laid back is associated with healthier DNA and improved longevity. Second, being optimistic. Optimistic, optimists are likely to eat right and to exercise regularly. They believe they will live longer and that they ought to take care of themselves. And as a result, optimists live up to eight years longer because of the lifestyle choices they make and because of that very positive mindset. Those living to 100 laugh often. Laughter is well known for physiological, psychological, social, spiritual, and quality of life benefits. People who regularly laugh are at lower risk for heart attacks, for example, the number one killer in our society today. And number four, personality trait being outgoing, making friends and forming meaningful relationships. Relationships keep our mood elevated and our stress levels lower and are strongly associated with improved um, longevity. So what tips can we make for adopting these very beneficial um, personality traits that can help us with longevity. And the study suggests, number one, to adopt a 10-year perspective. Ask yourself, does this really matter in 10 years? And if not, you can just let it go. We should eliminate the clutter in our lives to help us be more easygoing. Learn to say no to many good but non-essential things. When you say yes, you are in fact saying no to something else. So be very careful about what you say yes to. Have less on your plate, feel less overwhelmed, less frazzled as a longevity trait. Number three, the five minute gratitude journal to maintain optimism. Practice gratitude. This reinforces better times to come during difficult times, keeps us positive and attracted towards more optimal circumstances in our lives. And number four, daily physical activity to maintain optimism. Exercise increases happiness, it reduces stress, it boosts feel-good hormones and endorphins in our brain, such as serotonin and dopamine, improves our sense of well-being, and exercise helps us to relax. Number five, as a recommendation, spend more time with children. Leave your serious focus behind and engage in silly play. Learn to laugh more to improve that longevity trait. You can watch comedies to laugh more. Recall that 90% of people also feel shy. This will help us to be more outgoing. Keep it in mind to your advantage. Confidently reach out to make a meaningful connection 
with others who might who are more than likely too shy and bashful to make that connection towards you and have the objective to make a new friend each day to be more outgoing have the, having that goal really does change your outlook you watch for chances to meet someone new and when you do you can really listen to that individual to what they are saying find a connection to your own life make a new friend even if you can't find a new person every day have that perspective to look and seek out new associations and um, take advantage of those opportunities when they do in fact present themselves finally let's look at this from the opposite perspective the mind-body connection and how negative events can cause poor health results for example we know that heart attack risk rises after a divorce people who divorce face a higher risk of heart attack and remarriage may not be beneficial especially not for women this is a finding based on over 15,000 U.S. adults aged 45 to 80. At the outset, all were either married, widowed, or had gone through at least one divorce. And during the study period, 8% of these individuals suffered a heart attack, with the risk being higher among people who divorced versus those who had remained married. Women with one divorce were 25% likely to have a heart attack, while those with multiple divorces faced a 77% higher risk. For men, breakups seemed to have less impact. The heart attack risk was elevated by 30% only among men who'd been divorced at least twice. And once men were remarried, that risk seemed to disappear. So a protective effect of remarriage seen more in men than in women. Um, the effects of divorce being significant for both genders. We know that losing a job can be bad for your health. You would think that an unemployed person would have more time to exercise. In fact, unemployment is associated with increased body weight and a decline in physical activity. Um, unemployment increases death due to overdosing on painkillers, um, becomes tied to mental health conditions, which makes employment more dif difficult. In general, losing a job has marked and studied, documented disadvantageous effects on our health and well-being. We know that teens with depression are at a greater risk of heart disease later in life. And this is a statement from the American Heart Association this year in 2015, that those teenagers who can suffer from depression and bipolar disease have a significantly higher risk of heart disease. Depression or bipolar disease can mean anyone eats poorly or fails to exercise properly. And of course, both of those things can increase your risk of heart disease. However, independent of those poor lifestyle choices, depression and bipolar disease do appear to increase our risk of heart disease by a purely mind-body connection type of mechanisms. A statement by Dr. Benjamin Goldstein, these disorders indicate increased risk of heart disease that requires increased vigilance and action at the earliest possible stage. So in our patients who have a teenage or childhood history of these um, negative psychological conditions, we have to be particularly, um, particularly astute in watching for evidence of cardiac disease which is a consequence of those negative emotional states um, early in life. So to summarize the mind-body mind, the mind -body connection, we know that the mind-body connection is real, it's powerful, it is transformational, and it is probably underutilized in promoting our own health and well-being. We considered large bodies of evidence electromagnetic energy coming from each of our hearts that changes you, it changes others around you. We discussed the broken heart syndrome or attack at cardiomyopathy. We discussed conditioning using the Pavlov dog experiments to illustrate this. We discussed the placebo effect, the, effect of, the effects of optimism and heart health. We identified the best positive emotion to be that of awe. We discussed charitable giving, intuition, which recruits our faculties and generates more vitality within our well-being and within our bodies which animates us and predisposes us to success and probably optimal mental states which we know are associated with longevity we talked about divorce and heart attacks depression and heart disease job loss and mental health we talked about how feeling young can help us live long and the personality traits of centenarians those people who have lived well to age 100 
and beyond. And we have implications of the mind-body connection. We talk about congruency of your internal state, having positive feelings towards yourself. You should be your greatest ally in the maintenance of your own health, as well as positive feelings towards others and the effects that those can have on the people around us in improving their well-being. We need to be positive despite our material circumstances. Your inner experience shapes your outer world. Your inner experience shapes those around you. Let's fill ourselves with positive emotions. Those are strong feelings of love, gratitude, inspiration, compassion, forgiveness, and awe to maximize and harness our mind-body connection for our own best advantage. So harnessing the mind-body connection, developing the best mental state for optimal health. Uh, let's talk about this. The psychological composition of an individual. This is a very simple model, but it's one that I use in my own clinics when I meet patients for the first time and have about 30 to 40 minutes to meet that person, learn their history, hear their story, win their confidence enough to consent them for surgical procedures lasting four to five hours in duration at times. When I have someone in front of me meeting them for the first time, I think this person is, first of all, a composite of their purposeful learning and decisions that they have made. This person is intelligent. They've thought through things rationally. They're able to understand what I say at a rational level, and we can communicate based on their true construct of the world around them. This person is also a conglomerate of their unconscious agreements. What does that mean? Through life, we've all been exposed to information, to ideas and decisions that we've made by agreeing with information presented to us, whether or not we've had the chance to evaluate that information for its truthfulness. And as a result, we have a number of false notions and ideas which are contributing to our psychological makeup and influencing us either for bad or good. And when I meet someone, I realize that I'm dealing with probably um, a composite of both types of learning. One book I've enjoyed tremendously that really takes this topic on in fine detail um, allows us to ask the question, why are my thoughts and emotions not positive? And this is the book, The Four Agreements by, Doc, by um, Don Miguel Ruiz. Uh, he makes several points. One, children do not, do not choose their beliefs, but they agree with the information that's passed to them. So we become a collection of true and false agreements based on the information passed to us. For example, if a teacher tells a student that they are, that they are stupid and the child agrees, that child may then act stupidly for years to come so as not to violate their agreement. If the child really believes that he is not intelligent, he will purposely act in non-intelligent ways to support that presupposed um, understanding. So we can break old agreements and we can make new agreements. Correcting false agreements becomes a path to our own emotional health. The difficulty is, is we don't have a list of all the agreements we've made. We know they're in there. Um, how do we identify um, past agreements which are not serving us in an optimal way? The answer is by making new agreements. And the author proposes four agreements for positive mental health. And let's just look at each of these closely and take them for the opportunity that they do provide. Number one, the author says, is be impeccable with your word. Your word is your creative power. Speak in the direction of truth and love. Do not speak against yourself or gossip. Use your words to break false agreements. Next advice is don't take anything personally. What others say and do is a projection of their own reality. Nothing's, uh, nothing others say, say or do is really because of you. Be immune to others and avoid need, needless suffering because of other individuals. Don't make assumptions. Humans want understanding to feel secure. When we don't understand, we make assumptions. This generates false beliefs, which allows us and compels us to take things personally. Misunderstanding and need to make people wrong because of false assumptions. So don't make assumptions. And the fourth advice is always do your best. 
do your best at every opportunity and be aware that your best can change, whether you're sick or whether you're healthy, whether it's noon or whether it's three o'clock in the morning. Avoid regret and self-abuse by doing your best at every moment under the circumstances um, during which you find yourself as steps towards correcting your false agreements, improving your psychological health in a way that will unleash and hopefully engage your mind-body connection um, towards your greatest health and longevity. So we have this principle of being impeccable with your word, and we can suggest affirmations for healthful mind-body congruency. And this is really the topic that several authors have taken on in our history, and I'll invoke two of them, which I found particularly um, useful in this regard. The first is Florence Shovel Chin, who passed in 1940, classic book, The Game of Life and How to Play It. And a second author, Louise Hay, here in her series, The Power of Your Spoken Word. Again, tools that I can suggest that perhaps we can use to maximize our mind-body connection by inscribing very positive thoughts in our minds, in our other organs, in a way which our own bodies and our own psychology is encouraging our systems to produce and enjoy the greatest quality of life that's possible. So the power of your spoken word, Louise L. Hay, every word we speak is creating our future. Every thought we think is creating our future. Your thoughts create your life. What you think and what you say becomes true for you. She says, everything you think and everything you speak goes out from you into the universe, and then it comes back to you multiplied. It's almost as if the universe is listening to everything you say and everything you think and saying, oh, well, that's what they want. So let's give it to them. Too often we're speaking negatively about ourselves, how awful we are, we aren't good enough, we can't, get, we can't um, get this or we can't get that. How can the universe bring you anything good if that's the way you are talking? She suggests begin to listen to what you say, begin to listen to what you think, and don't say anything, don't think anything if you don't want it to become true for you. The power of your spoken word, your thoughts having their own energy, being like photons of quantum energy, which we put out into the universe, into the reality to resonate and vibrate, influencing that great checkerboard of life such that circumstances and opportunities arrange themselves and come back to us to bring us what, in fact, we have asked for. So ask for things that are helpful, ask for things that are most consistent with your quality of life and what you truly desire for yourself and realize that you can confuse the system by sending out the wrong signals, the wrong information. If you talk badly about yourself, the universe may send back to you cancer because you're speaking destructively towards yourself. So be very careful to be speaking words, to be sending thoughts consistent with your own health, well-being, and longevity. A very important principle that we really have not um, understood enough in the spirit of, of um, true full disclosure. Here's a picture of my affirmation cards. Sentences or statements that I make audibly on a regular basis with the right tonality with the intent of aligning my mind-body connection in a way that brings the conditions to my life which, which I seek and want for myself. So let's share a few of these affirmations that we can speak aloud in a very deliberate fashion by ourselves and to ourselves in a way that is hopefully optimizing and best harnessing our mind-body connection. These are statements that have been suggested by the two authors that I have presented. For the first, let's say, I love you. I really love you. Look yourself in the mirror, make eye contact, and repeat out loud with the right tonality, I love you. 
I really love you. Louise Hay says, respect and appreciate the incredible and magnificent being that you are. Like a small baby, be thrilled and rejoice that you have a body and are alive. Be filled with love, full of courage, and adore yourself. I love you. I really love you. And if your reaction to that statement is, oh, I don't love you. I know about you. I know you failed me yet last week. You've gained weight. You didn't get a, a good grade on the test. I know about you. I don't love you. If that's your initial response to that statement, then that's your first signal that there's work to do in this area. Keep going back to the mirror. Keep making the statement until that statement becomes true for you. Become your greatest ally in your own health and well-being. Another information, only good lies before me. Life is difficult. Your affirmation is only good lies before me. Say it out loud daily with confidence. Your voice resonating through your body. Your voice going out from you, coming back to your ears, to your brain, to your body. Only good lies before me. Ingrain it in every fiber of your being. Affirmation for adversity. None of these things move me. Florence Chin says, when you're faced with an adverse situation, agree that the situation is good, be undisturbed by it, and it will fall away of its own weight. Have no emotional response to an inharmonious situation, and it will fade away forever. So in the face of adversity, in the face of, a dif of difficulty, your verbal spoken affirmation becomes, none of these things move me. I love this one. I have a wonderful work and a wonderful way I give wonderful service for wonderful pay. I have a wonderful work and a wonderful way I give wonderful service for wonderful pay. Say it, affirm it, speak it out loud, speak it happily for your own career, your own job, your own employability, your own opportunities. Resonate that you have work, it is wonderful, you have pay, you it is wonderful, you give service, and it is wonderful. Let that resonate through every fiber. Infinite Spirit, open the way for my immediate supply. Let all that is mine by divine right reach me now in great avalanches of abundance. Give me a definite lead and let me know if there is anything for me to do. That's an affirmation for abundance and direction. We don't need to see the solutions to our problems. We have to simply affirm that the solution to our problem or our situation is out there and that solution is coming to us. Infinite spirit, open the way for my immediate supply. Let all that is mine by divine right reach me now in great avalanches of abundance. Give me a definite lead and let me know if there is anything for me to do. For direction and clarity, infinite spirit, open the way for the divine design of my life to manifest. Let the genius within me now be released and let me see clearly the perfect plan. I am fully equipped for the divine plan of my life. I am fearless and grasping the opportunities which appear before me. I call for guidance and protection every minute. I practice the presence of God every minute. Nothing is too small to bring to God. I acknowledge him at all times and my affairs go smoothly and miraculously. Our daily verbal affirmations for success, for happiness, for health, for well-being. Say it aloud. Let your words, your voice resonate through your body enter your brain through your ears, change your physiology over time through the process of repetition in a way that maximizes the health that you can obtain using that very strong mind-body connection that we describe in such tremendous detail. Here's an affirmation for medical healing. I deny the appearance of disease. It is unreal and therefore cannot register in my consciousness. I am a perfect idea in divine mind, pure substance expressing perfection. And an English novelist says something similar. He says, refuse to be ill. Never tell people you are ill. Never own it to yourself. Illness is one of those things which a man should resist on principle at the onset. So please don't say, well, the doctor said, 
that I will just deny my illness or my disease and I won't have it anymore and therefore I can quit my treatments and go off my medication and everything's going to be fine. No, we're not saying that at all. If you do have a diagnosis and that's been explained to you and it is apparent that that is the case, please be a good patient, cooperate with your doctor and take your medication. What we're saying here is that once you've done that and you go back and you are with yourself, your own psychology should not make your body a hospitable hotel or resort for disease where disease is welcome in you to lounge around, exist, live, grow, multiply, enjoy, do everything that it wants inside your body. Your body is not welcoming at all to disease and illness. And that's the mindset you can have that you can hold on to, to maximize mind body connection, to minimize and prevent illnesses from occurring in yourself. All the while you're accepting your diagnosis, complying with the treatment of your doctor and being a good patient. For yourself, in your own mind, I deny the appearance of disease. It is unreal and therefore cannot register in my consciousness. I am a perfect idea in divine mind, pure substance expressing perfection. I like the author, Dr. Joel Osteen. He's someone I saw this book in an airport and purchased it for the purpose of my flight. One of the smartest things I've done. I really have enjoyed the affirmations that he has provided, which are an extension of those that I've shared already. Um, I haven't seen um, Joel Osteen's program regularly. I have seen him several times on Larry King Live and enjoyed some of the dynamic that um, he had with Larry King, who's quite a dedicated atheist and Dr. Austin or Joe Austin being uh, an evangelist of sorts. And um, anyway, their interactions are always very curious. I appreciated his book and some of the affirmations that he's provided. What he's given is 30 affirmations, one for each day of the month, with his suggestion to speak that affirmation over your life, over your circumstance, one for each day of the month. And you can repeat month after month to maintain the very positive um, affirmation strategy and to keep it continually working for you and growing in your experience. He says, in a declaration for favor, I declare, and we use the right tonality here, I declare God's incredible blessing over my life. I will see an explosion of God's goodness, a sudden widespread increase. I will experience the surpassing greatness of God's favor. It will elevate me to a level higher than I ever dreamed of. Explosive blessings are coming my way. This is my declaration. That's from Joel Osteen, um, day one of his book. Let's jump ahead. A Declaration for Emotional Intelligence. I declare that I am calm and peaceful. I will not let people or circumstances upset me. I will rise above every difficulty knowing that God has given me the power to remain calm. I choose to live my life happy, bloom where I am planted, and let God fight my battles. This is my declaration. I declare that I am calm and peaceful. For us high-strung individuals, that one is particularly uh, useful. From day 21, here is his declaration for victorious living. I declare God's supernatural favor over my life. What I could not make happen on my own, God will make happen for me. Supernatural opportunities, healing, restoration, and breakthroughs are coming my way. I am getting stronger, healthier, and wiser. I will discover talent that I didn't know I had, and I will accomplish my God-given dream. This is my declaration. I'm Joel Osteen. And one declaration purely from scripture, which has been suggested to me, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Each day I am transformed from one degree of glory to the next. Goodness and mercy follow me every day of my life. So to summarize, for the mind-body connection, we see that this is real. It is powerful. It is potentially transformational. We can harness our mind-body connection, make it Align with our health and longevity objectives through correcting our agreements, which we can achieve with daily verbal affirmations, um, such as I have suggested here. If you like, please visit my website. If you enter your email address, 
I'll provide you with a regular newsletter. There's updates on information along this subject, additional health insights. I can provide you with the affirmations that I find um, most useful. In addition, on our media tab, if you collect on the YouTube channel, a video recording of this presentation will be available for you to review and study at your leisure. And I hope you take opportunity to do so and shoot me an email. Let me know how you're doing, what you've thought, and provide me with any um, useful feedback that you may have. I'd appreciate it very much. Thank you.